Okay. All right. Just sharing my screen, pulling it off. So I'm just on the uh, AWS website. I just went to the products and then I went to the database. Okay, database section of the product page. Um, so now AWS being a cloud service provider offers, uh, you know, wide variety of services, right? I mean, that would uh, mean compute services, network services, storage services, and database services. Database services is one of the most important service that AWS offers. Uh, which is being widely used by a lot of customers, right? And be it, uh, uh, you know, um, be it a My, MySQL or be it an Oracle, be it uh, SQL Server, right? So they're all being widely used by a lot of customers. And it's it, it's not just the relational database that AWS offers on, on the cloud, uh, but, you know, AWS also offers a wide variety of other database types, such as key value pair databases, in-memory databases, document databases, graph databases, time series databases, right? And, and so on and so forth, right? So that's that's the kind of, uh, you know, uniqueness of AWS where it gives, offers wide variety of databases where you really don't have to go elsewhere or you don't have to deploy anything on an EC2 instance and you don't have to build your own EC2 instance and manage the life cycle of the EC2 instance or the database on top of the EC2 instance, right? You get all of these out of the box, uh, right? In the form of a fully managed service, right? All that you need to do is to just go ahead and write the code for it, uh, build the logic and uh, design the database, define, design the schema for the database and then start making use of it in your application, right? So that's the uh, that's the advantage of AWS databases. Before we actually get into it, I'm just going to play this video, uh, the, the primary product video, the service video. Let's just quickly watch that. Feeling stuck to your old guard database provider with big price tags, high lock-in and punitive licensing terms? Break free with AWS databases which give you the scalability, performance, and availability of commercial-grade databases at one-tenth the cost. Hundreds of thousands of customers have saved time and cost, improved performance and scale, and innovated faster by leaving legacy databases behind and moving to AWS purpose-built databases like Amazon Aurora, Amazon DynamoDB, and Amazon Redshift. AWS databases are fully managed freeing your teams from the time-consuming and undifferentiated heavy lifting of database administration so they have more time to build applications. AWS databases were designed from the ground up with serverless auto-scaling and self-healing designs to help you scale quickly without worrying about performance and availability or being paged in the middle of the night for maintenance. AWS databases offer three to five times the performance of popular alternatives while scaling to support millions of requests per second with single digit millisecond latency and storing petabytes of data. AWS provides the broadest selection of commercial grade purpose-built databases, allowing development teams to build and innovate faster on any application use case. AWS offers more database engines than any other cloud provider, including relational, key value, document, in memory, graph, time series, and ledger databases. Hundreds of thousands of customers have started saving time and cost, improving performance and scale, and innovating faster by moving to AWS databases. Join them. Gain database freedom at aws.amazon.com slash databases. All right, so that's a very quick, <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, summary of what range of wide variety of databases that AWS platform offers. Okay, so now there are a few things that we all need to look at, right? I mean, they're all purpose built, correct? What is the meaning of purpose built? Purpose built is, I mean, they are with a specific purpose, right? I mean, we are not, uh, you know, right now, if you see the data storage needs have changed, uh, you know, time and again, and uh, the data storage requirements have 
have been transformed drastically right i mean in in those older days you know you never had uh, multiple variety of databases right so you had only relational databases rdbms is the one which which first came up but then eventually looking at the scale at which uh, and the volume at which the data is growing right and the digital is growing uh, quickly they realized that you know rdbms is not going to be scalable you won't be able to uh, you know store data and retrieve data from rdbms at a faster performance and scalability right for the internet scale right i'm talking about the internet scale like where petabytes of data is actually being stored right and managed and retrieved on a daily basis so uh, you know given such a requirement I, I, that's where you know newer versions of databases came up right so which did not follow the semantics of uh, rdbms right so which means that you know it will have a fixed number of columns right each column will have a fixed type data type right and uh, things like that right so now and also the other problem with rdbms is uh, you know the data that is stored underlying right it is all stored in one single disk okay maximum they can be clustered uh, in one in a partition right so now but that is not helping us either right because the moment you store all your data in a single disk that disk has got a, a limitation with respect to how much it can it can scale and how much it can uh, you know give the maximum performance right so for that perspective it's not possible to you know store all the data in a single disk and then retrieve it from a single disk then when distributed computing started coming in right and that's when distributed computing introduced the concept of distributed file systems so where you store the data you partition the data into multiple different partitions multiple different chunks store each partition in a separate disk distributed disk and then when it is time to retrieve the data run an algorithm which would assemble all the data and give it back to you right so that so the whole hadoop is based on that hadoop is based on a distributed file system right i mean which runs a map reduce program and then it uses the map reduce program to uh, you know bring uh compute closer to the data right the traditional in a traditional way the the data is taken to the compute right and transferred over a network to the compute and then the compute would uh, process the data and then give the results back it it either compresses that or it gives the filtered results to the end users but that's not the case with uh the other uh, distributed systems where the uh, in distributed systems uh you know compute is taken closer to the data itself data is not transferred anywhere eventually all of that gets aggregated at a much higher level so from that perspective purpose built right there are about 15 purpose built database engines including relational key value like you want to manage a key value at a very very massive scale you can go for a key value database in aws document you want to store documents you you can never efficiently store documents in a relational database okay of course you can store as a blob object but that's going to have a lot of negative implications with respect to the performance of the database okay so for doc, for storing documents there's a separate document database in memory okay again in memory is used for very very fast processing right which can't wait for the disk to return you the data and then read it from the disk so rather store all the data in memory right it's like a uh, it's like a big ram which is there right and uh, that ram will actually store all the data in its in its memory okay so that's that's called in memory database like sap hana sap hana is a example of an in memory database the entire sap hana is stored in memory it's not stored in the disk uh then graph databases right graph is again another important thing right linkedin all of us use linkedin correct and linkedin uh gets the tree correct i mean who is linked to who right and who is related to what and what is my first connection second connection third connection right how does it find all this it uses behind the scene some sort of a graph database to draw the graph between you and your friends your friends friends or friends connections and so on and so forth 
then time series time series is for used for you know where you want to actually plot a graph or plot some data which is time which is flowing right like a ecg correct ecg is time series correct i mean every second it gets the pulse rate uh, every second it gets the this, this thing uh, hertz parameters and then it plots the graph right similarly time series is uh, like uh, is used quite frequently or quite uh, extensively in uh, industries where they are monitoring the health of their equipments so every second or every minute the health of that equipment is sent so based on the health of the equipment you know decisions are taken and ledger databases right ledger databases is where you know you use it for maintaining managing ledgers right again um, you have distributed ledgers where blockchain is involved right so that way uh, it's it's purpose built and you know you pick and choose whatever you want uh, you know which whichever database type solves the problem best for you you go for the database you don't compromise that okay aws is only offering rdbms i have to stick only with rdbms that is not the case aws offers multiple different varieties of databases each is purpose built each is for a specific use case all those use cases are well documented you just have to go uh you know create a new instance of it and start using it that's it and all the other weight lifting heavy weight lifting such as managing the underlying ec2 instance managing the underlying compute hardware storage maintenance backups everything is taken care by aws you don't need database administrators who would need to do this job on a day in day out basis rather your database pe person can actually focus more on uh implementing the business logic Uh, for the problem that you are trying to solve so that's 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 what is a, it's a fully managed being fully managed right so where you don't have to do anything it's it's managed end to end by aws it's a full package aws is giving okay then performance at scale right i mean uh, you 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 basically get 3 to 5 times faster performance uh, you know uh, on relational databases and non relational databases uh, and in non relational databases like dynamo db you have a sub millisecond latency okay microsecond to sub millisecond latency is what you get in a dynamo db kind of a database uh, and also if you look at the price of it it's like one tenth of the commercial databases when you go for a commercial database uh you know all all you need to do is to kind of go get into a contract get into an enterprise agreement with the uh with the database provider and uh, you know and then you basically get into a licensing terms with them you know pay annual licenses right and then pay for upgrades right and also you get only limited uh, quantity to use with the with the license it will be a core based license a cpu core based license and you cannot exceed the license Right. Yeah, and and you can't exceed that core based licenses, and so that way, uh, you know, you you have to basically pay a lot more on the underlying infrastructure for the database engine to manage the, those databases. You need people, right? So that way, you know, the performance what you get on cloud is three to five times faster, and also at a cost of one tenth of compared to a commercial database. and it's not that you know just because amazon aws is giving these databases at such a inexpensive price it doesn't mean that they are not enterprise in class they are enterprise class right uh, there are so many customers who are using rds or the databases on aws correct it provides all the features that your on premise database provides such as security high availability reliability correct uh, and resilience and all of that is supported and if you want to spin up a global cluster you can also do a global cluster with multi region multi master replication all the features of replication right for usually in rdbms uh, when you set up a cluster uh, the primary and slave the master and slave it's called master slave architecture the master will receive all the reads and writes and bit the between master and slave there will be a synchronous replication uh, you know setup so that any record that comes to master is also replicated to slave in a synchronous way okay not in an asynchronous way in a synchronous way they are replicated so now 
you know based on that i mean if the master goes down the slave will become master okay and the slave will actually continue to do master's job okay so that that way you are having a high availability of it for your databases right so all of those features all of those enterprise class features are available encryption is also available uh, or both you know in transit and at rest okay so now what are the databases types that aws offers the first one is relational where you have the traditional applications which uses rdbms so in fact in the week one um, ravi sir had taught all of you the oracle <coughs> excuse me had taught you oracle and uh, oracle is a traditional i mean relational database right oracle uh, mysql sql server postgres sql right so these are all uh, you know traditional databases traditional rdbms databases which are used by traditional applications erp systems crm systems and it's also used by e-commerce platforms to store the transactions and things like that in a, in a rdbms so aws offers three services one is called aurora the other one is called rds third one is called redshift okay we will look into each one of those shortly okay uh, and then you have key value pair databases where the key value pair databases uh, store uh, you know every object as a key value pair okay and uh, you know it, it, it's it's like uh, you know used in high traffic web applications which require uh, you know you pass the key it returns the value right so such kind of systems and e-commerce systems gaming applications use this okay and uh, you know it's 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 not a relational database it's a no sql database right how many of you heard of the term no sql raise your hands okay z003 Okay, only Z zero zero three, Z zero seven seven. Okay, Z zero zero three. Can you explain what a no SQL is based on your understanding? Uh, sir, uh, the data is not stored in tables. I mean, no SQL database, Mongo database, uh, example, and the data is not stored in tables. I mean, only that thing and also. Okay. 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 So. i mean you are partially right it is mongodb is a no sql database but it's not that it is not stored in tables the no sql database also has got tables but they are called slightly differently but the whole point is no sql means that it's not that you won't write sql you will still write it is not only sql it's sql plus other things also okay sql is structured query language correct so where you write a query uh, and pass it to the database engine database engine executes the query gets the data and returns it back correct whereas in a no sql it is not about there is no sql it is not only sql where uh, you actually uh, uh, do more more than what a sql query does and it does not follow the same conventional features of the same conventional methodologies that uh, your uh, uh, standard database does right so you still have tables but the tables are different they are all dynamic in nature right i mean in a traditional rdbms you create a table and the table will have say five columns right each column is has a fixed uh, uh, has a fixed data type correct and there are constraints Uh, there's so many things, right, in a relational database. Whereas in a NoSQL, the number of columns for each row could vary. Okay, for example, row one can have five columns, row two can have six columns, row three can have three columns. So that way, uh, it it can vary. So basically, that's that's called a NoSQL database. Uh, Amazon has got a Amazon DynamoDB, which is a very very popular NoSQL database. We are going to actually do some. lab exercises on this tomorrow on the dynamo db and uh, 
you know we are going to actually start looking into some of those aspects of dynamo db tomorrow then in memory right uh, in memory is again as i said cache cache is an in memory database right so where you store the data in cache right yesterday we spoke about uh, cloud front right so where cloud front is actually uh, caching all your content in all edge locations right so similarly out here if you see in memory database is used for caching session management gaming leaderboards geospatial applications right like gaming leaderboards right i mean gaming leaderboards if assume there are 100 people who are or not 100 times like uh, keeping it simple uh, assume there are like 1 lakh people who are playing game on online game right on one of the online portals okay and uh, you know there is a leaderboard that you have correct so you now that leaderboard should have uh, it it keeps changing right i mean this microseconds also matter in a game correct so in such cases you can't store it in a disk it has to be stored in memory Uh, in a cache right so that it can be easily processed so such cases you know the, when you want to show the leaderboard there is a microsecond difference between millisecond difference between two participant two players you have to actually process it very quickly you can't wait you can't delay so that's basically for in memory then document databases there's something called document db okay uh, mongo db compatible it is um and uh, you know where you can actually use it for for content management use it as a content management uh, what is content management content management system cms is basically a place where you manage the content where you author content where you author documents right and you you store documents things like that right like google docs you have right so that's basically a content management system so you want to build a content management system of your own if any of you would want to basically build a product in the future you can go for amazon document db which has got a compatibility with mongo db as well because mongo db handles that very well then there's something called wide column right so where uh, you have requirements with uh, you know databases which would need a wider column which has data types that supports wider column right basically a wide column store is a type of no sql database it uses tables rows and columns but unlike a rdbms the names and format of the columns can vary from row to row in the same table right so that's called the wide wide column database where key spaces cassandra right cassandra apache cassandra is again an open source product project okay which provides a no no sql database so amazon key spaces is basically a wide column it's called columnar databases okay it's a no sql columnar database uh, where you can use it for industrial applications for equipment maintenance fleet management route optimization and so on and so forth right then you have graph database right where you want to query millions of relationships like the example that i gave where linkedin facebook it's where the query relationships between uh, highly connected graph data sets with millisecond latency at large scale right i mean if i just go to facebook and i have my friends list correct I mean, but suddenly if you see uh, a friend that um, uh, you know one of my schoolmate whom i have lost touch over the last 10 years 15 years suddenly he pops up in my uh, in my friend recommendation correct how is it possible right so that's where you know it uses some sort of a graph database to understand the networking social networking between you and your friend right and then it uses recommendation engines it's also used in fraud detection correct where banks do the fraud detection uh banks run online fraud detection real time fraud detection on your transactions correct when you swipe your credit card correct and uh, that at that at that point when the credit card transaction is being processed uh, the bank also run a fraud detection uh, algorithm behind the scenes to check whether the uh, the transaction is genuine or is it a fraud so in such cases you know it's basically a, uh, they use graph database and amazon neptune is 
used here uh, for uh, as a graph database then we have time series database right so where you want to as i said industrial telemetry right where you have uh, equipments running in your factory correct and uh, you know each equipment is actually generating a lot of data with respect to telemetry right in terms of the metrics multiple metrics right like you take a boiler in a chemical plant you need to constantly monitor the parameters of the boiler right such as its temperature its humidity correct its uh, uh, pressure the pressure inside it right and things like that so all these are uh, have to be monitored in a very close time sensitive fashion right because the moment the temperature crosses say 2000 degrees centigrade or the pressure crosses a certain threshold right you will have to take some action on it otherwise you know there is a chance that the boiler may blast so in such cases uh, you know you need uh, some sort of a database uh, which can receive telemetry it's called telemetry where it can re re receive the telemetry in a time series fashion right when time series is uh, right uh, for example 9 o'clock this is the data point 95 this is the data point 910 this is the data, data point right so that way it keeps flowing into it and then on top of it you can run your programs and you can run your patterns and algorithms to understand you know what is the trend that you are seeing with respect to a certain time series data weather is a time series data right i mean weather forecast and weather is a time series data because every hour you know the temperature keeps changing correct and uh, in fact there are so many popular data sets available publicly there are open source data sets available publicly which has a time series data in it you can just download them in fact those who of you are interested in learning and taking data science as your stream career stream you know uh, amazon time stream time series databases are going to be quite important and valuable for you because uh, you will actually run a lot of time series algorithms and uh, you will use those algorithms to basically predict the outcomes of a certain pattern okay based on uh, based on ai and ml you know using supervised and unsupervised learning techniques okay uh, that's time series then you have uh, ledger database right so basically it provides a centralized and trusted authority to maintain a scalable immutable and cryptographically very verifiable record of transactions for every application right it's like a ledger right like banking transactions uh, okay so all of us might wonder right i mean in bank applications when banks are using uh, databases and things like that right behind the scenes uh, and you, all of you all of us know the concept of ledgers right ledger right you forget about the computer you have a book right a ledger book which is which which we can find even today right where, where we go to some small businesses or small shops who don't have you know it uh, systems or who don't have computer systems they still continue to use a small book called ledger where they uh, write the credit and debit okay uh, for every transaction that they make and towards the end of the day they go out and tally it right and so tally left equal to right okay if there is some difference then they go into where the difference is coming from Yeah, that's called like tallying, and that's called ledgering, maintaining a ledger, right? And then they also do a month-end and year-end ledger book tally. Okay, and then they open a new ledger book, and the year starts. So similarly here, uh, when in electronic systems, where in databases, when you have databases which is actually storing these transactions, which are being automatically processed, uh, you need to have a mechanism where uh, you need to figure out that you know nobody tampers with my database my tables correct like similar to how you have when you maintain a physical book uh, where if somebody tampers the some one of the transaction in the physical book you will come to know correct because somebody would use a whitener to erase that and then the overwrite on top of it or if somebody overwrites it you you come to know right so that way you know if somebody tampers your record somebody goes behind the scenes logs into the database and then changes the directly go to the table and change the value right you will never know in a tra traditional rdbms right so that's where if you see ledger databases uh, ensures that you know 
uh, it's a trusted and centralized authority to maintain a scalable immutable immutable is the key there right i mean it's not mutable you will never be able to you know mutate it it is immutable you will never be able to once written it's written you can't change it and you can't touch that record right and they are all cryptographically verifiable record of transactions for every application that's called amazon qldb okay and in fact this is used in blockchain also in fact blockchain is the same concept where when you have uh, when you implement a blockchain uh, it's basically a distributed ledger system so where uh, there are different uh, uh, you know authorities who have to approve the transaction before it can be uh, accepted in the system right so that's the concept of a blockchain okay and uh, if you want to build such a banking transactions or some registrations that you want to do which you think nobody can uh, you know tamper with oh. right i mean even administrators can also tamper right i mean the administrators are managing the system but uh, it is always possible that the administrators could tamper the system and could change the records right and so this is where the systems of record is maintained in a ledger kind of a database okay so so these are the different uh, databases that we have right and there are some use cases which you can all you know read through like internet scale applications right i mean this is basically a high level architecture of an internet scale application which uses uh, dynamo db and aurora right where dynamo db uh, like this is basically for what is the use case here build globally distributed and internet scale applications that can handle millions of requests per second over hundreds of terabytes of data these dbs automatically scale up and down to accommodate your spiky workloads and you only pay for the resources you use to optimize cost savings and you don't need to maintain servers upgrades or backups at your applications and your applications have automated high availability right so if you see here there are players and publishers right players are actually coming through route 53 is a dns service uh, then all the data is stored in s3 like your website you've built a website game infrastructure built on fast networks and simple publishing workflows right you are using s3 and cloud front we have done the test today correct where we used s3 to host our website we used cloud front and then it basically goes to load balancer and then you have your databases then you have your elastic map reduces basically a, a kind of a equivalent to hadoop it provides you hadoop on the uh, aws it's a managed service of hadoop on aws then scs it's basically an email servers okay so now this is one example where the player data is persisted on the database with scalability optimizes micro transaction system efficiency where you can use aurora Uh, for real time applications again you want to minimize the time spent uh, every time you know uh, uh, the the application has to read and write from a database it's a very expensive operation right i mean for every transaction it has to go to a database rather you introduce a cache layer right similar to what we did in cloud front yesterday every time a user sitting in europe or us has to get the data from my s3 bucket which is in mumbai uh, the latency is much higher correct similarly in databases also every time the application has to talk to the database the latency will be higher and for cases where you feel that uh, certain records are not going to change and certain records will uh, will will have a longer lifetime uh, and certain data will have a longer lifetime you can simply cache it in a elastic cache Okay, it's an in-memory data store, so the application can directly read it from the cache instead of going to the database, which will be much faster. Okay, real-time applications such as caching session stores, gaming leaderboards. I spoke about the gaming leaderboards. Ride-hailing, correct? Ride-hailing is again one important concept these days, right? Like Ola, Uber of the world, correct? So where it doesn't every time it doesn't go to the database, right? So if if a route uh, So, for example, from uh, high tech city to I mean, but right, so there is a, a route which is optimized based on the tra current traffic conditions. If it is already the algorithm has identified a route, 
that is stored in the memory so next time when somebody wants to write from amirpet to uh, sorry high tech city to amirpet the entire algorithm does not go back to the database rather it fetches it from the cache until it changes okay it gives a microsecond latency and high throughput to support millions of requests per second okay and uh, uh, it, this is this is quite a uh, you know a very common use case when building applications which are latency sensitive in nature open source applications right so when you want to uh, use open source databases for low cost because you don't want to pay for the license cost for the commercial databases like oracle or sql server and things like that right so you want to go with the open source databases you can go with all of these right all these are open source aurora mysql maria db postgres sql uh, you know aurora actually provides supports all these three databases mysql maria db and postgres sql all of us must be aware of mysql correct <clears throat> you must have done some exercises or you must have done some hands on in your college colleges with mysql it's a open source very powerful database rdbms okay but when you use my open source databases it could be difficult to manage it in the production so that's where if you take it as a managed service you know you don't have to worry about the underlying maintenance of it you only focus on your business logic and the code that you have to write the rest of it performance scalability and availability is managed by aws when elastic as caches uh, uh, can be used along with uh, you know your open source databases enterprise applications where you have your enterprise applications you want to have uh, you know uh, you know a, a type of uh, high availability and resiliency in such cases uh, you can use uh, aurora with which has a multiple nodes like a master slave so if you see this in data center invest it uses a master database instance and then there is a slave database instance so the application actually talks to the master for all writes some jobs might actually talk to slave for only reads because the replication between master and slave is a synchronous replication and it's eventually consistent okay and uh, who who knows asset properties asset what is asset that the one call is ma'am sorry class is not class 0054 raise the hand can you please explain 0054 what is asset Z zero five four, please unmute and explain what does asset stands for. Hello, sir. Hello. Sir, sir, this is Z zero four eight. Yeah. Yes, sir. Asset stands for atomicity. C is uh, for A. It is atomicity. C it is consistency. Uh, I it is integrity, D it is durability. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. So, so basically, if you want your enterprise applications and you want to follow the asset properties, right? Asset properties are actually offered by uh, your RDBMS databases, right? So, I mean, that's where you know you can actually go for uh, you know an eventually consistent uh, mechanism where master and slave are always in sync. and if you see this setup it will be like one tenth of the cost of a commercial database that is the advantage of this particular setup which uses aurora okay and yeah so 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 this is basically a quick summary of what are the various different database services now if you, you can also get this drop down to understand uh you know what are the various different databases and you will it will actually take you to the uh, product page of these 
databases. Okay, you get everything here: Aurora, RDS, Redshift, Dynamo DB, Elastic Cache, Document DB, Neptune, QL DB. Okay. But one thing that you all need to remember is AWS offers a very wide variety of databases. So it's like a one-stop shop. You don't have to go elsewhere for all your needs. You know, you can just uh, you know pick up something from AWS. And there's also a database migration service within AWS. The DMS provides uh, you know uh, a mechanism to migrate databases from one database engine to another database engine. Okay, and also DMS helps with disaster recovery strategies where you have your, uh, uh, you know, you, you have your databases in two different regions and you want to basically keep both of them in sync. You can also use DMS to keep both of them in sync all the time, right? Where at a transaction level, DMS takes the transaction and then copies it over to the other side another copy of the database. Yeah, you can just go to the migrations. In fact, more than 300,000 databases are migrated to AWS, if you see. And there's so many uh, use cases and benefits that you will see. Reliability is one of the major benefit that it offers. Yeah. See if you, you can you can migrate from Oracle and SQL Server to Aurora, Amazon Aurora. Now you can migrate from Oracle and SQL Server to RDS. Okay, RDS is the relational database. RDS. Uh, so in fact, RDS and Aurora are pretty much uh, similar, look similar, uh, but RDS is something uh, where uh, uh, you know. Uh, it, it it basically uses one of those six popular database engines, right? So where it uses Oracle, SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, SQL, and MariaDB. Uh, so now within Aurora, Aurora is an engine which is uh, built from the scratch by Amazon. Okay, it is not something which uses one of those open source projects like Postgres, SQL, or MySQL. Uh, Aurora is an engine which is built from scratch. Uh, where it is compatible with MySQL and Postgres SQL. Okay, that is the uh, beauty of Aurora. So that way, Aurora is very, very cost effective and it's performance wise, it's three to five times faster than the traditional MySQL or Postgres SQL. Okay, uh, which is which is used in RDS. RDS is a slightly old style. Uh, in fact, the, the, the database services in AWS started with RDS. Later, Amazon came up with their own engine called Aurora. Okay, so now let's do one thing. Let's actually go into first RDS. Okay, RDS, yeah, so if you see this, uh, document DB now with MongoDB compatibility and asset transactions. That's why I was asking what is an asset transaction, right? If you should know these things. I mean, these are basic interview questions. You, you, you may be asked, explain what an asset transaction is all about, right? So you should explain, you know, what an asset transaction is, is all about and you should be able to uh, you know explain the intent of why you need an asset transaction okay all right so rds right so now rds is is called relational database service uh, makes it easy to set up operate and scale a relational database in the cloud okay it provides cost efficient and resizable cap capacity while automating the time consuming administration tasks okay so now rds is basically an engine uh, a managed service engine on top of one of those six databases which it supports, okay, which is either Aurora. Aurora is also a database by AWS, right? Postgres SQL, MySQL, MariaDB, Oracle database, and SQL Server, right? So out of this, all of you are quite aware of Oracle, SQL Server, uh, MySQL, and Postgres SQL, right? Postgres SQL has become popular, um, you know, uh, off late, right? Over the last maybe 10 to 12 years, Postgres SQL has become very, very popular, right? Till then, MySQL was quite popular in the open source community, right? 
uh, where you know you don't you don't want to pay the price for database engine you need some you are looking at something which is open source in nature right my sql was very very popular then postgres sql came and uh, no, no, it, it's not that my sql has gone down my sql and postgres sql are both very popular in the open source database communities and in the enterprise uh, you know commercial databases sql server which is microsoft's product and oracle uh, which is which belongs to oracle so they are like quite uh, you know uh, you know relevant and quite popular in the world of commercial databases okay so now that's where if you see rds actually gives a wrapper on top of these database engines aurora aurora is a database that as i said which amazon built from scratch however aurora is compatible with mysql and postgres sql so if you have your database running on mysql and postgres sql you can lift and shift it on top of aurora or you can build your own uh, database on aurora from scratch which will be compatible with mysql or postgres sql yeah um, all right so that's postgres sql mysql maria db oracle and sql so these are the six engines that rds supports when you go to rds console you will be able to provision one of these six database engines okay uh, let's quickly see the quick video of this Relational databases are at the heart of your most critical applications, but they can become difficult to manage and operate with high availability as you scale your app, installs, patching, monitoring, performance tuning, backups, scaling, security, hardware upgrades, and storage management. Database administration is resource intensive, taking time away from building your application. Amazon Relational Database Service (RDS) simplifies database management by automating time-consuming administration tasks. With less operational overhead, your team can focus on optimizing applications and getting faster results. Amazon RDS gives you the freedom to use your relational database of choice, including the most popular open source and commercial engines, and Amazon's relational database built for the cloud, Amazon Aurora. Aurora is MySQL and Postgres SQL compatible and offers the performance and availability of traditional commercial databases at a fraction of the cost. RDS allows you to scale across a global footprint of data centers with enterprise high availability and disaster recovery no matter your size. RDS automates many previously cumbersome tasks, automatic failover, backups and point in time restore, disaster recovery, access management, encryption, secure networking, monitoring, and performance optimization. All these and more can be enabled with a few clicks or API calls. Even highly regulated industries can leverage RDS, which meets a broad range of compliance certifications. Hundreds of thousands of AWS customers use Amazon RDS today. Find out why with a free trial. aws.amazon.com slash RDS. All right, so that's basically the RDS, right? And uh, uh, you know, if I'm just going to the uh, AWS console, uh, so you can just type RDS here, and you can type any of those, right? I mean, you can type uh, DynamoDB, you get DynamoDB. You can type Aurora. It's actually part of RDS only. RDS Aurora. You just get it. RDS. And type elastic cache yeah elastic cache and memory cache you get those neptune neptune just type rds click on rds takes me to the rds console okay but but i'm not going to do any lab exercises today neither am i going to give you any lab exercises today we're going to come back to this come back on this and tomorrow the whole day we are only going to do uh, hands-on and lab exercises, right? So today I just want you to just introduce you quick, quickly to, uh, you know, how you access it and where do you see those databases and things like that. And DynamoDB, don't, don't create any databases today. I'm going to give you some exercises tomorrow where you can 
get your hands dirty with some of these you can just go create some tables and then motv and things like that so but before that you just need to understand a few concepts right so that's where I'm just coming to primarily you know we'll tomorrow in our session you know we'll actually create an rds database which uses probably a open source database because using uh you know sql server or oracle will be a slightly expensive affair we'll also see free tier which free tier that rds offers Okay. Here also you get sound 50 hours of t2.micro. Same t2.micro. For MySQL, Postgres, uh, and Oracle BYOL or SQL Server. Okay. So these are the. Uh, this is the. This is what we get. And DynamoDB is also quite cheap. Okay. DynamoDB is like, you know, you can create a. 25 GB of free DynamoDB table without any charge. Okay, and it is enough to handle up to 200 million requests per month. Yeah, you can do enough hands on with DynamoDB. So, we're going to do a lot of hands on with DynamoDB because that's the future. Okay, DynamoDB and Aurora, that's the future. So, we'll, we'll just do more more with, uh, you know, some of these and, you know, let's, let's get more and more hands on with all right so so that's basically rds and rds basically supports these six databases right so then let me move from rds to Yeah, I'll, I'll, then I'll go to Aurora. Okay, Aurora, as I said, is a uh, relational database which is built grounds up by Amazon, but it's compatible with MySQL and PostgreSQL, uh, which provides the performance and availability of a commercial grade database at one tenth of the cost. Let's quickly review this video. Today's database world is an unhappy place for database administrators and software developers. You're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Either you use old guard databases that offer enterprise capabilities but cost a fortune, or you use open source databases that are difficult to scale. Free yourself and get the performance and availability of commercial databases with the low cost and flexibility of open source databases with Amazon Aurora a relational database built for the cloud. Aurora is MySQL and Postgres compatible, making it an easy choice for your new or existing applications. It's up to five times faster than MySQL and up to three times faster than Postgres and scales automatically to keep up with your applications. Aurora makes six copies of your data distributed across multiple locations and continuously backs it up to Amazon S3, so your data is safe. For globally distributed applications, Aurora can replicate your data across multiple regions for fast local performance and disaster recovery. Aurora is fully managed, so you can set up, operate, and scale a database in the cloud with just a few clicks. For unpredictable workloads, you can use Aurora serverless to automatically start, scale, and shut down a database to match application demand. Aurora gives you enterprise-grade performance, scalability, availability, and security with the simplicity and cost-effectiveness of an open-source database. Move to the cloud, build faster, and run simpler with Amazon Aurora. Get started today at aws.amazon.com slash rds slash Aurora. Yeah, so that's basically Aurora. So where's... Uh, you know, you, you you are looking at building a next gen application, which needs a um, uh, which needs a relational database. Then your natural choice should be for, to go to Aurora, and Aurora basically supports MySQL and PostgreSQL. Okay, and it's fully managed by Amazon. Right, you don't have to do anything. 
you just need to build and deploy and uh, you know configure it and uh, you can also go global in about um, you know a few minutes you can just go global you can deploy your aurora in multiple regions right and you can have your application basically interact with aurora in multiple different regions okay so that's that's aurora then i'll go to redshift okay redshift is again another interesting uh, uh, you know in terms of uh, you know what so now okay so now you have your databases right uh, reporting capability okay how is it now how is it now ha okay fine is it better ha okay okay so okay so now you have your uh, uh, real time transactions oltp transactions it's called oltp right online transaction processing that's called oltp right you also have something called olap olap what is olap is anyone aware of the expansion of olap online application protocol sorry online application protocol mm, no not really it's called online, online analytical online yes. analytical yeah online uh, you know oltp is online transaction processing olap is online analytical processing okay it's called analytics so now when you have to build analytics where you have to take so much of data from from your main rdbms and you want to store it in usually it's called data warehouse correct so it's like you have a warehouse right so where you have your you have your retail shops or the retail shops would actually get the goods from the objects from things from Histori yeah, yeah, historical right? data correct historical data right so that's where you have you know olap you know where the olap is basically a data it's called data warehouse where the data from multiple different sources are plumbed into the uh, data warehouse and the data warehouse has the cap capability and capacity to uh, load all the data process the data and give you reports okay like historical reports like for example i am let's let's take amazon itself amazon dot in e commerce right Uh, Amazon dot in must be generating lot of reports on a daily basis to understand the sales trend uh, in every different city in every different region, correct? And uh, by you know by the type of uh, you know things that they sell, right? For example, electronics. Let's take electronics. Let's take Amazon Fresh, right? And Amazon Fresh, you know, they are selling groceries, right? They want to understand what type of groceries are being sold and what area right so now in order to process this data it, it's a huge i mean you need so much of data and you need so much of compute power to process this data and generate your reports so that you can get insights out of it and you can also uh, for example for some reason your electronic sales have dropped that's when you know the electronics department in amazon might actually do some analysis as to why the electronic sales have dropped and they can actually look at how to improve the electronic sales by taking preventive corrective measures Yeah. So now that's where if you see, Redshift is the most popular and fastest cloud data warehouse. It's a data warehouse based off cloud. Okay, a lot of customers are actually using Redshift. I mean, it can, uh, it can ingest data from multiple different sources, and it can process all of the data, and it also has integrations with S3. Like S3, you can store data in S3 also, right? So where you can store objects in S3. Right, so that way it has integrations with S3, and that's called data lake. These these days, data warehouse uh, has transformed into data lake. Okay, that's a, that's a term that all of you should be familiar with. A data lake is basically a, it's like a lake, right? I mean, where you have a lake and with water in it, right? So similarly, data lake is where it's a huge lake, you know, which has got data in it. So any application which needs data. uh it can go to the data lake get the data and process it okay so that's an example the architecture that you're seeing here is basically an example of it right so where you have your s3 which is a data lake 
and then you have redshift and you take query from s3 and then you expose expose export the data to s3 then you have federated query with your relational databases such as your aurora and rds and then all of that is being fed into your analytic services like uh, emr elastic map reduce which is a hadoop and then you have your sage maker sage maker is a uh, aiml platform in aws okay and athena is a querying language in aws right and then visualization you have to visualize it right you have to show the visualization to end users so you can use quicksight to visualize all the data that you have like graphs bar charts pie charts and so on and so forth right all of that is basically and tableau tableau is another popular tool with for visualization right where you have you can use tableau also or third party apps as for an analytics app okay so that's where redshift is being used okay so okay let me move on to the next one redshift aurora we'll go to dynamo db dynamo db is interesting let's view this video you've just built a promising new app that the world has never seen before new users are coming in but can your database scale to handle all the requests? Amazon DynamoDB. It was to handle internet scale applications at Amazon because traditional databases just weren't built to handle Amazon Prime Day's million. There's some glitch. You've just built a promising new app that the world has never seen before. New users are coming in, but can your database scale to handle all the requests? Amazon DynamoDB. It was built to handle internet scale applications at Amazon because traditional databases just weren't built to handle Amazon Prime Day's millions of requests per second. It's a fully managed service, so you don't have to worry about patching and upgrading your databases to the latest version. This means you can sleep in peace without being paged in the middle of the night. Not only are encryption and data recovery built in, but DynamoDB has an industry-leading service level agreement. DynamoDB handles more than 1 trillion requests per day, and more than 100,000 AWS customers use DynamoDB. Get started today with DynamoDB, the hyperscale database for modern apps that need performance at any scale. Wow. 1 trillion requests every day to DynamoDB. It's a mind boggling, right? So in fact, uh, as you just heard in the video, Amazon's e-commerce platform actually built DynamoDB for their own use, okay? Uh, so that's where, you know, they wanted a replacement for expensive commercial databases. And then they went ahead and built DynamoDB from scratch, which could scale, okay? from like you have uh, your sports car, right? I mean, zero to 102 seconds or zero to 106 seconds, right? So it can actually, you know, scale much faster and it can just scale within a matter of few seconds, correct? So that's where DynamoDB is very, very popular, right? And a lot of companies like Airbnb, Lyft. Lyft is a is a equivalent of Uber in the US and other countries also. <coughs> Mission critical workloads are actually being stored in DynamoDB, right? Yeah, so if you see DynamoDB can handle more than 10 trillion requests per day and can support peaks of 20 million requests per second, right? Which is uh, the example that we, we all just heard, Prime Day, Amazon Prime Day event, right? So on the Prime Day event, imagine how many orders are being processed. Amazon and delivered, right? All of those are actually going in DynamoDB. Okay. So again, DynamoDB is going to be one of our focal point for this course because DynamoDB and RDS are the two key things. Aurora are two, two key things that we are going to learn in depth tomorrow and we are going to do some hands-on. So DynamoDB is very, very important. DynamoDB is the future that you know, AWS is betting big on and with a kind of powerful features that DynamoDB gives. 
Okay, we have few few more databases like Elastic Cache, uh, Document DB, Key Spaces, Neptune, Timestream. Okay, what I would do is I would just let you, you know, go through the videos on each one of those today, right? And uh, you know, all all I'm going to I'm not going to give you any assignment for today, uh, and and you can you can just all I want you to do is to go to aws.amazon.com, go to products, click on database. Go to the database homepage, read through this, right? Uh, just this. I mean, you don't have to go through the blogs. If you have time, go through the blogs, read through this, and go through each and every database present here, like like the way we reviewed it. Go through the homepage, and then view the video if the video is available, and understand you know what is being used for which purpose, right? And tomorrow, what we are going to do is we are going to do some hands-on with Aurora and DynamoDB. Okay, we are going to spin off Aurora clusters, uh, build some databases, connect to the database, build a small patch store application, right? And then allow the patch store application to actually interact with the DynamoDB or Aurora. Got it? Or you know, it can even be S3, right? We can even do it in S3, simply on S3. We don't even need an EC2 instance. We'll build a small application on S3. We'll host it on S3, make an API call to DynamoDB, query it from the DynamoDB and show it on the HTML page. Okay, these are the two, three exciting things that we're going to do tomorrow, okay? But for that foundation is, all of you have to learn this today. Go through this, right? Uh, see as much as videos as you want in YouTube about uh, Aurora, RDS and DynamoDB. But get an understanding of all of this because this will help you in interviews. Okay, so that's that's it for today, right? I'll basically let you all go complete your remaining exercises from yesterday, right? So for those 12, 13 people who got AWS accounts from us, you were not able to do the CloudFront exercise yesterday because of access denied. But now you should be able to do it. So please go ahead and continue to do that in your breakout rooms and study about the RDS today, right? It's all the data, it's all available on the website. I'm not going to give you a document, but just go ahead, uh, follow the steps that I've told you, read it, come prepared for tomorrow. We are going to get bootstrapped with doing some hands-on work for tomorrow. Okay, so any questions on this databases so far, the last one hour, 15 minutes that we spoke about? Anybody has any doubts or, or anybody feels something is missing in the database? You can very well. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, what is the actual difference or exact difference between the IAM user and root user, sir? Uh, okay. So root user is God. And Okay, root user is the user that you created when uh, when you subscribe to AWS. Okay, using your email ID. But after that, you are just provisioning IAM users uh, with limited privileges. You're not giving all the privileges to the IAM user. You're giving limited privileges to, like you are founding a company, right? You will, you will user. So you will be the root user. You will have all access to the AWS. You're hiring few people in your organization and you will create an IAM user for each user, each employee that you hire and you give assign that employee, that particular IAM user. That's the difference with limited privileges. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. No problem. Okay. So uh, so I think uh, I think we're good. So how many of you were able to complete your CloudFront assignment yesterday? Please raise your hands.
Okay, I still see half of the class not raising your hands. Are you not able to do it? Okay, all right, good. So at least half of you are able to do your assignments and uh, you, you were able to basically access your website, right? Did you see the difference between accessing it directly through the S3's endpoint URL versus accessing it through CloudFront, right? You're able to see how fast it loads when you use it CloudFront, through CloudFront, right? Okay, yes, cool. So yeah, thank you. So the rest of you, I mean, who are not able to do it, I mean, yesterday for the sake of, you know, the access denied issues, please do that today, right? You can go into your breakout rooms and do that. And in the breakout rooms, uh, please read for the next one, one and a half hours. You can actually read about the databases topic that I just told you today. And then we'll do some hands-on exercises tomorrow. We'll build a small web application using DynamoDB and Aurora. And then we will uh, make some transactions to the database and it will be quite interesting. Okay. And don't skip tomorrow's session. It's going to be important. Today's was foundation because I want all of you to understand the kind of databases that AWS offers. But tomorrow's is going to be a lot more practical. Okay. So come prepared and don't skip tomorrow's session. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you all. Too. Sir. Yeah. Sir, this uh, S3 is not meant for uh, dynamic uh, websites and uh, operating systems to ho host, right? Yeah. So S3 is not meant for hosting operating systems. You are right. But websites and also dynamic websites, right? And dynamic websites can still use S3 to store their static content, but they cannot store the dynamic content like a database, right? But in the database, yeah. you have dynamic content, correct? You can't use it to store the database. Sir, but uh, if we want to uh, host our dynamic website, uh, mm -hmm. how do we approach it? Uh, so what do you mean by dynamic website? Just give me an example. I mean, uh, user interactions and uh, server. Yeah. Uh, you can still use S3. Yeah, you can still use S3 where you, you always have your HTML as your static, right? Within the yeah. HTML, you could write some code, right? Using Java or server side code. That server yeah, side code can't be hosted on S3. But yeah, you can still host your static HTML part on S3. And when you click yeah. the button, the button can invoke a backend server side code, which will interact yeah. with uh, your backend database or things like that. And again, render the, render the HTML back to the user's browser. Yeah. That is possible. We are going to do that. We are going to do that in the next week. Okay, as for the yeah. uh, you know you. curriculum, we'll we'll I'll I'll make you build one static page and dynamic website, so you will understand that much better. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? I oh, sorry, I cut you in the middle. You you had some some other follow up question, right? Was that Z043? I think Z039. Z039. Okay. Okay. Got it. So that's the difference, Z039. Yes, sir. Okay. Z039. Oh, thank you. Okay, all right. So then uh, I'll let you all go into your breakout rooms, respective breakout rooms, and continue to finish your assignments so far if you have any backlogs. And then uh, read the material for today. And then we'll again regroup tomorrow to uh, do some database exercises. Okay. Sure, no, thank you.